All right. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome everybody to our fifth virtual reading in the Groiler virtual reading series. My mom was going to do her um, welcome like she usually did in the in-person poetry readings, but she called me about an hour or two ago and said she was getting very nervous that she was going to have technology difficulties. <laughs> so she said, can you please do it, Didi? I'll wave. I'll wave it through the... the <laughs> so she says hello. And, and so I'm just welcoming everyone on behalf of the Mikitis and the Groiler team of volunteers and staff, um, Elizabeth, James, uh, Celia. And tonight I'm actually going to hand it over to Partridge Boswell, who is a dear friend and one of the most loyal supporters of the store. Um, he was the winner of the Groiler Discovery Award some years ago and we published his first book of poetry. So poet and friend Partridge Boswell is gonna do the, the MC honors tonight and introduce the hosts. So I'm gonna kick it over to Partridge. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Didi. And um, I couldn't be happier to be here. Welcome everyone, it's wonderful to see you. What a crowd we have. I hope we have enough chairs. Yeah, I'm alluding, of course, to a very good problem that uh, we experience sometimes during live readings at the bookshop. And I'm um, very pleased to say we're heading in that direction soon. Very soon, we're gonna, we're gonna be seeing that phenomenon again. Um, but though we're not hosting live readings yet, I'm delighted to say the bookshop is now open again, at least two days a week from noon to five on Thursdays and Fridays. If you can, please come visit us. Uh, if you can't visit us in person, books by Andrea and Gail, including their latest, Everything in Lands End, along with any other poetry book you can imagine, can be purchased online at growyersbookshop.org page. So um, that's our preferred vendor. If you uh, want to purchase your books of poetry, do it through Bookshop and that way a percentage of the proceeds for every book will go directly to Growyer. That's a wonderful thing. We're very grateful for that. Stay tuned on our website and I'm doing the, uh, these are the pre-show announcements by the way. Uh, our, our website and us uh, if you haven't already subscribed to our newsletter, subscribe, and then you'll know what uh, further upcoming events will be happening. We have a reading April 22nd with Pragita Sharma, Peter Filkins, and Lawrence Robb, which you won't want to miss. And we are also very pleased this year to be supporting our friends at the Mass Poetry Festival. Um, that happens May 13 through 16. Specifically, the Groyer will be sponsoring the festival's headline reading Saturday, May 15th. Very exciting lineup with Boston Poet Laureate Portia O, oh, recent Pulitzer winner Ty Hemba Jess, and the amazing Naomi Shihab Nye. So um, you want to be sure to check out the Mass Poetry website for all their festival events. It's, it's a real poetry packed, action packed festival this year in the middle of May. We're very pleased to be a part of it. If you have uh, comments for tonight's poets or questions for the bookshop, please feel free to use the chat. And before we get to their credentials, I just want to take a moment to give a shout out and thank these poets for their tireless work as stewards of poetry as prime movers of the Blacksmith House Poetry Series for bringing such a robust and remarkable array of poets to our community month after month, year after year, furthering the series mission as founder Gail Mazur has said, to keep things going, to support and validate the work of poets, to make a dent in the isolation writers feel in their working life. As Stanley Kunitz wrote, art withers without fellowship to bring poets from different worlds together. So here's to their efforts toward that fellowship with our gratitude. And now to tonight's poets. And I will, uh, I'll introduce them both 
And that way they can read seamlessly back to back without interrupting the trance. Gail Mazur is the founding director of the Blacksmith's House Poetry Series, as we've mentioned, and the author of many books of poems, including They Can't Take That Away From Me, a finalist for the National Book Award, and most recently, Land's End, New and Selected Poems. She has won fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Bunting Institute of Radcliffe College, as well as the St. Batolf Club Foundation Distinguished Artist Award. Of Gail's poems, David Rivard has said, no one, and I mean no one, writes poems as chock full of such nuanced feeling as Gail Mazur. She is as good as it gets. And we'll be hearing exactly what David Rivard is talking about in just a bit. But first, Andrea Cohen. Andrea Cohen's poems have been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Three Penny Review, Poetry Magazine, and plenty of elsewheres. Her seventh poetry collection, Everything, was recently published by Four Way Books. Other recent books include Nightshade and Unfathoming. And as we've said, Cohen currently directs the Blacksmith House Poetry Series in Cambridge. As Christian Wyman says, the poems in her new book, Everything, are so short and sharply formed and so individually memorable that one is caught off guard by their cumulative force. This is a work of great and sustained attention, true intelligence, and soul. We're thrilled she's here with us. Andrea, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Partridge. Um, thanks to the Mankitis. Thank you to um, Elizabeth. Um, thank you to um, the Academy. No, that's another one, never mind. Um, you know, um, I gotta say, uh, it is, I know we all like to be in the same place, but it is, it is, it makes me so happy to see all these faces from different parts of my life over the years. Um, people who are so dear to me, who I love, and uh, none more so than, than Gail Mazur, who I get to read with um, tonight. So that is a privilege. Um, and I can also say that, you know, the Grolier has meant a whole lot to me. I went to school at Tufts. Um, so I used to go into the Grolier when I was young and, and, and when I moved back to Cambridge when I was, when I was 23. And, um, and I remember when I had my first book, taking it to, to Louisa and saying, so how does somebody get their, their book sold in this store? And uh, she, she, she did not make it very easy, I must say. So I'm glad that it's, it's a little easier now. Um, so thank you all. Um, and I'm going to read um, some poems from this book. Um, and then I'm going to read uh, a few new poems as well. Um, so thank you. Wrecking Ball. Its offices are thin air. On days off, it still goes in. Wrecking Balls are workaholics. They hang around up there. And even the idea of big sky crumbles. Um, and I'm going to ask one technical issue. Um, so for the speaker, are, I'm still seeing um, Partridge, right? Um, is that how it should be? I think that's a personal setting on your computer because for me, I'm you, me? Um, you. So yeah. I think you have to go to, uh, to speaker view. Yeah, speaker view. Yep. Set yourself to speaker yeah. view. Okay, great. You should okay. be featured. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I'm going to try to read some slightly different um, poems as well because um, some of you might have heard some of these, but if there's repetition, I, I apologize. Desert Isle. If I have to go there, I'd like a phone book I can sit on, on a chair. I'd like to believe I'm a child someone comes back for. Everything. 
Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt, Kurt Vonnegut said. Everything was beautiful and nothing hurt, the girl slurred to the artist at the tattoo parlor. The word made flesh isn't fictional. It's beautiful. It hurts. After. After the accident, we had the phrase, after the accident. Also this, before the accident. We had a drawer marked before and after. And after and before happenings, we'd add atrocities and incidents and the wild asters someone before and after keeps leaving. Craft talk. I paint small birds so when they fly off, their loss might seem like less. Fellow traveler. She went everywhere with an empty suitcase. You never know when you'll need to leave swiftly with nothing. Right as rain. Try saying that as the giraffes neck and neck are slowing for Noah. Gratitude. How fortunate having fallen to fall in with a ladder made of light. How inviting ideas, how inviting ideas are, climbing into bigger, into better bright. I tried and tried but couldn't on two rungs hold fast. Panicked I was until recalling the alpinist slipped inside a crevasse, a man who frostbit, exhausted, unable to climb up, willed himself to slip down more. One goes sometimes that deep into an icy self and finds therein an islet of light, an opening and ghost-like from some ancient glacier stumbles. Um, maybe you all saw that movie a few years ago of this man who got caught in a crevasse and, and couldn't get up and, and decided, well, he had to see if there was a way out by letting go. And, and I, it just, you know, it's a hard thing to wrap your mind around to imagine what that was to let go for him. Um, and he got out, yeah. Ring. To throw your hat in is to make yourself bareheaded, ready by oils to be anointed, or by arc hard rains of an instant, stricken. A few years ago, I gave a reading at my high school, which was a, and remains a Christian preparatory school for boys and girls. And uh, clearly they didn't do a very good job with me. Um, and, uh, but one of the, but th it was a bright group of students. And one of them said to me, wow, you have a lot of poems about the Bible or sort of taking off from the Bible. And I said, oh, I never noticed that. And I thought, yeah, I do. They're just really good stories. Self-portrait with eraser. I drew the eraser first because I knew it better than I knew myself and because it had been around the block before me and because it would, after having its way with me, rub up against everything I'd ever loved. bootstraps. So you pulled them up. What cobbler made those shoes? And whose hands 
asking nothing, gave them to you. I can tell you I wrote that poem because um, at the uh, school where I used to teach, they had this young man come and give a talk. And he had written this book and had these ideas for this reality TV show. And he had uh, basically gotten himself dropped off in this town with $500, I think, in his pocket. And he said that, you know, within a year, he would be back home. Um, with, I don't know, a car and $2,000 or something like that. And he basically his message was, you know, everybody can take care of themselves and you don't need to be helping other people, et cetera, et cetera. And I kind of felt like, wow, you know, you, you, you knew at every step of the way that if you needed help, you would, there was just a phone call away. Um, and you look a certain way and you come from this background. And uh, so, um, I don't remember his name, but that's that's for you, young man. That phone. Too long. Too long at the fair, the song laments. No one sings of hanging around too long at the hospital. Someone kept getting stale coffee in paper cups. Someone kept punching a vending machine as if another hour might come out. Rail. By the time we'd built the handrail, the hand had vanished. Yet still, there was a sky to rail at. Shiva. Evenings we sit in the living room together. Friday, I take my mother's slot, noon, at the beauty salon. Ruth, who for 40 years washed her hair, washes mine. We're all in the desert together. Your mother liked the water cold, Ruth says. News to me, from a thousand mouths are dead assemble. Registry. They asked for what they'd need, one cup and one plate, one day whose stunt double would be night, and two miners' lights for when each was lost to the other. Magician. Anyone can saw a woman in half. The hard part is sitting with both halves at breakfast, asking one to pass the salt and the other to lick your wounds. That's what polyamory is, loving all the charlatans you are. Love, it's an extreme sport like indoor beekeeping. One of my favorites. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I think I'm just going to read a couple more from this book and then I'm going to read some new poems. This is called Bearer, B E A R E R. It's kind of a hard word to pronounce, Bearer. We raised the flag from half to full mast, and someone had to ask what didn't happen. After the end, listen, there were other ends, other reckonings. There were other one size boots, one kick fits all. There were other dark days no night could mirror. Hear me out if someone above the rubble can. 
bell. There was a bell that rang in my dreams. It was beautiful and I was careful not to ring it too loudly lest I wake. And then I'll read a few new poems. So some of these, you know, are probably, you know, in, in uh, uh, unfinished maybe. This is called The Truth Comes Out. I have always wanted to be an equation. Okay. So mostly I've wanted to wear an equal sign in my hair or on my person. What a strange phrase on my person, as if my person were an entity trotting along beside me. I've always wanted such an entity, a kind of kind doppelganger, stand in, what have you, so that when I needed spare bits or a pat on my back or just someone else to ask the waitress for an extra patty melt, well, voila. Also, it would be neat if this backup could speak French pleasingly. S'il vous plaît, pour favor, saying please in any language can be handy. Could you loosen the duct tape of night, bitte? Tac, pifori? Could you please tell me I'm doing the human thing right? And while we're at it, that all things being equal stuff I'd like, please, with a reliable climbing partner to finally get to the bottom of that. Between the wars. It's the phrase we had after two world wars. So don't say bloodshed invented nothing. This is blueprint for my friend Kiel. Blueprint. Everything we see before it is, is sky tinted. The Book of the Dead. You have to feel sorry for the dead. They have just that one book to read and it isn't exactly a page turner. No plot, no character development, no time travel. It's like reading the telephone directory for a town that long ago got blown out to sea. Mostly the dead read quietly to themselves, but sometimes a child arrives and insists on a bedtime story. So an ex-soprano or radio announcer reads aloud to the bawling kid who wants his mother, who wants to know why there are no pictures of crocodiles or spaceships, why there's no scratch and sniff of forests or horses, why there's only this dull barrage of names and dates, these Jobs and Raymonds, these Ebenezers and Rachels and Susies, and who is it who wrote this stupid, endless book anyway, he asks, and why is my name in it? Stretch. In limbo, I spoke into the phone, which translated that as in limo. In limo, she wrote back, OMG, she wrote. She'd asked me to marry her casually, daily, the way you'd ask someone to bring home milk. In limo, she repeated, this time inside emojis of station wagons and champagne. And I thought, isn't limbo a kind of limo, a stretch of the actual, a sawing it in half and adding a luxurious bit to slip into? What color is the limo, she asked. Glittery, I lied. Sequined, I added. At a point, one gets out the saw, one opens up to let the mess and glamour of another in. One says, home, James, and the limbo driver into unverifiable nights drives on. And... Uh, I think I'm going to read um, maybe maybe uh, maybe one more poem. 
maybe two more poems. Okay. Um, this is called Pinata. It's not a lot to blindfold a child, to give him a couple good spins and a wooden bat, to tell him to swing his little heart out. Harder is to stock the pinata with rotted plums, with nettles, with a confetti of IOUs to fill that hollowness with consequences, with the truth about how nothing swung at blindly with force and glee yields anything resembling sweets. And uh, one more, and thank you all for being here. Dinosaurs in my head. How did they get there? They heard the word extinction and being wise creatures decided to hide where fire and ice, where time couldn't find them. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Andrea. Wonderful. And um, as I said, we will seamlessly hand it right on over to you, Gail, if that's all right. And, and you are now muted, so we'll have to unmute you as well. My time, my yeah. moment in the sun. Thank you. And thank you, Andrea. That was wonderful. And as always, it's a joy to to be with you in your poems. I, I, I want to say how grateful I am that, um, that the Groliers continued, how grateful I am to the Mankiti family and to th those of you who work with them to keep this um, haven going. And um, I would like to dedicate my reading, if that doesn't sound too big a deal, to my beloved oldest and best friend, Elsa Dorfman, who brought me to the Grolier, it must have been the day after I moved to Cambridge. And um, in many ways she changed my life, but that was one step, that was one step in the change. Um, so to, to Elsa, whom I will always miss and whom I always love. I decided today that I would, I, I, I almost never read older poems, and I thought I would try to do that and stay within a sort of modest amount of time. So um, I'm going to start by reading the only poem that I've kept from my first book, Nightfire, not because I didn't like the others, but because it had page limits, Drat. This is called Baseball. And, and it's probably a Red Sox fan poem, although it doesn't, doesn't mention the Red Sox at all. Baseball. The game of baseball is not a metaphor, and I know it's not really life. The chalky green diamond, the lovely dusty brown lanes I see from airplanes multiplying around the cities are only neat playing fields. Their structure is not the frame of history carved out of forest. That is not what I see on my ascent. And down in the stadium, the veteran catcher guiding the young pitcher through the innings, the line of concentration between them, that delicate filament is not like the way you are helping me, only it reminds me when I strain for analogies. And the rookie, when I strain for analogies, the way a rookie strains for perfection and the veteran and his wisdom seems to promise it, it glows from his upheld glove. And the man in front of me in the grandstand drinking banana daiquiris from a thermos, continuing through a whole dinner to the aromatic cigar, even as our team is shut out 
nearly hitless, he is not like the farmer that Plotinus speaks of in Bruegel's Icarus, or the four inevitable women-hating drunkards yelling, hugging each other, and moving up and down continually for more beer, and the young wife trying to understand what a full count could be to please her husband happy in his old dreams, or the little boy in the Yankees cap already nodding off to sleep against his father, program and popcorn memories sliding into the future, and the old woman from Lincoln, Maine, screaming at the Yankee slugger with wounded knees to break his leg. This is not a microcosm, not even a slice of life, and the terrible slumps when the greatest hitter mysteriously goes hitless for weeks or the pitcher's stuff is all junk who threw like a magician all last month, or the days when our guys look like Senate cops, slipping, bumping each other, then suddenly the play that wasn't humanly possible, the kid we know isn't ready for the big leagues, leaps into the air to catch a ball that should have gone downtown, and coming off the field is hugged and bottom slapped by the sudden sorcerers, the winning team. The question of what makes a man slump when his form his eye, his power aren't to blame. This isn't like the bad luck that hounds us. And his frustration in the games, not like our deep rage for disappointing ourselves. The ballpark is an artifact, manicured, safe, seen in an Easter egg. In the order of the ball game, the firm structure with the mystery of accidents always contained, not the wild field we wander in where I'm trying to recite the rules, to repeat the statistics of the game, and the wind keeps carrying my words. <laughs> Can people see and hear me? I'm just having somebody's name on the screen. Well, I'm not getting an answer. So. No, I cannot see you. Why, why keep, people can't see me? Now I can. Now I can. Now you're back. And now your you're sound back. is good. Oh, okay, great. Great. It's nothing I did wrong, right? Right. <laughs> Bedroom and oral. I, I, I was married to an artist um, from the time I was 21. And I always said I didn't like ekphrastic poems, but they seem to keep coming from me. Now there's a sign on the screen, Gail. Oh, darn. It just has somebody else's name, but can people hear me? Yeah, I don't know. It's um, something's going on. I, I have you as my featured speaker, but I think everyone needs to mute themselves <laughs> and you need to go to the right top corner of your screen and make sure that you're on speaker view. But don't worry about it, Gail. It, it resolves itself in a few minutes. Well, I yeah, you're still featured for me. OK, I'd like to be featured for the world. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but th okay. there's a lot of noise on someone's screen that is interfering with um, uh, like babies crying and um, um well so is can everyone be muted except for gail okay i'm gonna do that again i'm gonna mute everybody and then gail will unmute herself am i Unmute yourself, Gail. Muted. Okay. All right. I'm going to read to a black screen now. That's what I'm reading to. Bedroom at Arl. A painting he thought would rest the brain, or rather the imagination. Sloped room, chrome yellow bed, poppy red coverlet. His own pictures hung askew or painted as if they were. 
He'd splash cold water from the blue basin, then take his blue smock from the peg. Whole days outdoors he spoke to no one, straining as he had to alone for the high yellow note. Decades ago, I longed to be like him, an isolate, a genius. Beneath the poster of his raw, crooked room, I planned a life amongst life, a location. I was sure craziness was a side issue, like the Mistral's dust that whitened trees that drove him indoors to paint, an obstacle yet oddly fine. Now it seems a century has gone by since I read his daily diary of pictures that fevered year at Arles. Blue cypresses, apricot orchards, our lazy end faces, this bedroom. A century at least since I underestimated danger and quarantined myself in the one room, trying on a little madness, a little despair, waking in the fictive mornings, not awake yet to like, like his, yellows, like sulfur, like lemons, like fresh butter, not golden or glazing, but homely. Uh, this, this poem is actually a translation of a poem that I discovered in, in Italian, which I don't read, and in a very bad 19th century translation, a poem that Michelangelo wrote while he was painting the vault of the Sistine Chapel. And Michelangelo wrote hundreds of poems. He was as productive, more productive as a poet, actually. And they hadn't been translated for a long time. And I loved this, even its awkward translation so much that I just worked on it with my husband, Michael, who was a, an Italophile and fluent. I love the dynamic of despair, of complete failure, when he is painting the fault of the Sistine Chapel. And it's addressed to his friend, the painter Giovanni da Pistoia, when the author was painting the vault of the Sistine Chapel. 1509. I've already grown a goiter from this torture, hunched up here like a cat in Lombardy or anywhere else where the stagnant water's poison. My stomach squashed under my chin, my beard's pointing at heaven, my brain's crushed in a casket, my breast twists like a harpy's. My brush above me all the time dribbles paint so my face makes a fine floor for droppings. My haunches are grinding into my guts. My poor ass strains to work as a counterweight. Every gesture I make is blind and aimless. My skin, skin hangs loose below me. My spine's all knotted from folding over itself. I'm bent taut as a Syrian bow. Because I'm stuck like this, my thoughts are crazy, perfidious tripe. Anyone shoots badly through a crooked blowpipe. My painting is dead. Defend it for me, Giovanni. Protect my honor. I am not in the right place. I am not a painter. That's one to put on your wall when you're feeling discouraged. For decades, I was a really chronic migraine sufferer and that mysteriously disappeared about five years ago. This is, this is addressed to my migraine Dear Migraine is the title. You're the shadow, shadow lurking in me, and the lunatic light waiting in that shadow. Ghostwriter of my half-life, intentions ambush I can't prepare for, ruthless whammy, you have me ogling a blinding sun, my right eye naked, even with both lids closed, glowering sun, unerring navigator around this darkened room, 
You are my laser probe. I'm your unwilling wavelength. I can never transcend your modus operandi. I've given up trying to outsmart you, and the new thinking says I didn't invent you. Whatever you were to me, I've outgrown. <coughs> I don't need you, but your tenacity embodied, tightening my skull, my temple, like plastic wrap. Many times I've traveled to a dry clam climate that wouldn't pander to you, as if the great map of America's deserts held the key to a pain-free future. But you were an encroaching line in the sand. Then you were the sand. We spent the best years of my life intertwined. Wherever I land, you entrap me in the unraveled faces of panhandlers, their features, my features. You, little death I won't stop for. Little death luring me across your footbridge to the other side. Oblivion's anodyne. Soon, I can't know where or when, will dance ache to ache again on my life's fragments, one part abandoned, the other part abundance. To the makers. And, and this is um, my homage to poets who, that came before me, whom, whom I worshipped and was inspired by, and who's, you may identify them, but I don't mention their names, to the makers. You were like famous cities with rivers and traffic, with architecture from ingenious eras, with protest marches and festivals museums and pharmacies and criminal pleasures, all the essentials needed to endure. Reading you, I revisit your structures of grids and avenues, your alleys. I follow overgrown paths. I visit the terror and joy of being lost, the ways to court discomfort, to dare chaos, the knowledge of drowning in a pitch dark harbor. Tyranny and wars advance to your histories, also, infirmities of soul and body were your portion. Yet you were not yearning only, not heartbreak only. You were not the loneliest people alive. It was your work, and then you had one another. You spoke with gods and heroes. You cherished your conversations in many languages. It is true you were secretive, observers, spies, but that was as it has to be. It was only your work you were given to serve. You weren't mere investigators of useless things. The pragmatic seemed no more or less suggestive to you than articles of turbulence or rapture, strands of hair in a basin, light in a dusty stairwell, a pitcher of sangria, woe and laughter, the feel in the hand of a broken thing. Day by day, your lives were a tumult of beginnings. When you began, you couldn't know. This you keep showing me, where your constructions would lead. What you made, you made from the inchoate, muscled and shaped not toward the monumental, but toward a form of truth that would matter. The inaccessible become necessary. Though I am speaking to you, I'm not alone, nurtured by your art. Even today, you animate the minutiae of the vast, unsigned cosmos. And though the 20th century ended without you, now, decades after your precipitate departures, your pages are still touched by many, still touch many, and the lit screens you never used sing your lines. This next poem is from my, my new book. Well, all these poems are in my new book because it's select, selected. Land's End, I wish I was holding the cover up to you because it's beautiful, but I'm holding it up to myself. 
blue work shirt. I go into our bedroom closet with its one blue work shirt, the cuffs frayed, the paint stains a loopy, non-narrative of color, of spirit. Now that you are bodiless and my body is no longer the body you knew, it's good to be reminded every morning of the great mess, the brio of art making. On the floor, the splattered clogs you called your Pollock shoes. And um, two more poems. Mount Fuji. And this this is addressed to to Michael um, and uh, it's it it is about us and it's about Hokusai Mount Fuji Hokusai and Hiroshige my first presence to you two linen bound books that closed with looped ribbons and faux ivory clasps. Decades later, we gaped at Fuji from a window of Japan air and gasped together in Narita, a park so immaculate, white rocks gleamed graphic in a river of gravel. Later still, you'd move between the floating wor worlds of ukiyo and woodcuts and Chinese landscapes, whose surfaces entered you as if it had been fated. A draftsman's draftsman, Hokusai at 70 thought he'd begun to grasp the structures of birds and beasts, insects and fish, of the way plants grow, hoped that by 90 he'd have penetrated to their essential nature, and more by 100, I will have reached the stage where every dot, every mark I make will be alive. You always loved that resolve, you'd repeat joyfully, Hokusai's utterance of faith in work's possibilities, his reward that at 100, 130, he'd perhaps have learned to draw. In Edo then, his beloved Fuji was seen as the true source of immortality. As for him, it was to be. Will you always give me such spectacular gifts, you asked me, that day, that day when we were 20? And I'm going to read a new poem, which is actually, um, it, it was written for, for a collection at, at the Smith College Museum, published of poems about art in their collection. And I naturally chose a poem by Michael, a, a drawing by Michael Mazur called Three Trees. August afternoon, rag paper, Windsor Newton charcoal, blackened kneaded eraser beside you in the grass, three bare oak trees. You loved what you call the spikiness of forms, agreed with Rodin that nothing in nature is ugly. Monumental, burnt, those trees expressive for you as close as if your charcoal had been made of them. You love the susurrus of brush on canvas, the shh, shh, the charcoal made on paper. You even liked ekphrastic poems. I hated them. You'd love me writing this. That day I asked, was it the only time I asked what you'd been thinking while you drew? And you looked at me blankly You'd already explained so much to me that day. I wanted to know more, to be inside you, inside your working mind. What? What? How you answered. Tree. 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 Thank you.
It's nice. Wonderful. Thank you. It's nice to see. Did my picture ever come on? It didn't, right? Yes. Oh, it did. Oh. You were featured. Yeah, I think it's a, it depends on whose computer. Oh. It's a, yeah, it's individual. Well, that makes me feel better. <laughs> Well, that, that ended too soon. I'd love for you both to go on a little bit more. If you have more you'd like to read. Hmm? What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> um, sometimes we, we invite uh, readers to tell us about uh, events that they may have coming up on their schedules or, um, or it would be appropriate to maybe tell us about the Blacksmith House uh, series and what is what, what we can anticipate next month or so. Oh, you know, I meant to say, and I forgot because of the technology, how grateful I am to Adrian, Andrea, who actually I met first at, as my student for, for just a brief workshop but that she came back to Cambridge and that she was willing to continue the blacksmith house. It's been a joy for me and, and I'm incredibly grateful and hope, um, hope we can somehow keep passing it on forever. Thank you, Andrea. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah. We're, we're lucky to have Harvard Square and so much, you know, the life of poetry that, that, that is so strong there. Um, and uh, with the girl year, yeah. Right, right. Um, our readings um, for, for the next uh, few weeks are all um, listed uh, at the Blacksmith House um, website. Uh, Yusuf Kumanyaka um, will be there and um, lots of other um, fabulous poets. Um, yeah. yeah. Wonderful, thank you. And we also included up at the, um, I just put a link to the Black Poetry in the chat and also much earlier in the chat, we included links to Andrea and Gail's books on bookshop, so you can go directly there, and um, to including their new their new stuff. There it is. Yeah. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you all so much. I don't know, Partridge. Do you have any any parting words for us? No. Or only to thank our poets uh, for stunning and uh, nourishing readings. And, uh, and we hope to see uh, all of you again very soon, if not Zooming live and in person. And I'd also thank you for stick, sticking with us through uh, the, the Zoom wrinkles there. Um, yes. Especially, especially, uh, <laughs> thank you for persevering. But, uh, we're getting through it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Gail, for letting a lawyer listen in. What? Thank you for letting a lawyer listen in. Oh, well, I, I have to be protected. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you for coming, Harvey, and thank you for Elsa. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Andrea. Beautiful what reading. would Harvard Square be without you, Harvey? Harvard Square. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Because you would like by our members, that's what's right. USAA, what you're made of, we're made for. <laughs>